news. But I think that uh, it's a great, great privilege for us uh, to have the author of a book, First Taste, How Indigenous Australians Learned About Grog, speak about uh, that publication on the day it's launched. So I'd like now to welcome Maggie to speak to us. Thanks. Thank you, John. And thank you, Romley, very much for those kind words. And I'd like to um, pay my respects to the Ngunnawal Nyambi people of the Canberra area. And thank you, everybody, for coming this evening. Thanks to CAPA as well for sponsoring the evening. And I'm very honoured that Robin Room agreed to come along and to present um, tonight as well. The publication that forms the basis for this presentation was released this morning. So it's a set of six small books that deal with episodes in the history of how Indigenous Australians learned about alcohol. And the research was funded by an ARC postdoc and with a grant from the AER Foundation. And I'd like to thank that organisation for its valuable support and also for the, actually, the publication of the set of books. And I'm pleased that there's so many AER people here tonight and also one of their directors, Anne Mosey. And although she's away in the UK, I just wanted to acknowledge formally the creative design work of Mooley McKenzie, who I've worked with before on the Grog book and so on, and she designed First Taste, and that's why it looks so beautiful. The books can be distributed without charge, thanks to the AER's grant, um, and I hope that they will go to people who can make practical use of them. They're designed to challenge old and fatalistic views about indigenous drinking and direct attention to the role of the social and cultural settings as potent learning environments. So I'd like to talk a bit about um, some of the findings of the books, but I'm going to start off with a little um, story about grog itself and then with the idea of the first taste of it. Grog is a word with which all Australians have more than a passing acquaintance. For Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people, the term is perhaps even more commonplace and ubiquitous. It's used colloquially for individuals who drink on the grog, grogging on, or do not drink off the grog. It's used for the places where drinkers drink, grog camp, or purchase legal or illegal supplies, grog shop, sly grog. It's used for the suppliers, grog runners, for incidents, grog fights, or outcomes, grog sick, grog shake. The word is still in use in 21st century, residing comfortably somewhere between the Queen's English, slang, Aboriginal English, and Creole. It slid easily into Indigenous language usage and was taken up by Aboriginal people from the earliest days of settlement. In the 19th century, Queensland Aborigines referred to alcohol as gorogo, and today at Borolula, Yanua speakers use this loan word to describe a person who is actively engaged with grog, krukkumara, an alcoholic. The word itself was born in 1740, and it derives rather incongruously from a coat the coat in question was worn by the 18th century British Admiral Vernon, the brave man who decided to dilute the Navy's daily ration of half a pint of neat West Indian rum, around 55% alcohol by volume. In effect, diluting this drink was an early attempt to what we would now call harm minimisation. Admiral Vernon famously wore a thick coat of what the French called grogrin or grogram cloth and he became known to his men as old grog because of this and the term was soon transferred to the drink that he created grog grog the word was brought to Australia with the sailors of the first fleet and it soon passed into general usage so while other English speaking nations commonly use words such as booze or plonk grog persists 
as a peculiarly Australian term for alcohol. There are two accounts of the first alcoholic drink accepted from Europeans by by Aboriginal people at Botany Bay. One derives from Philip Gidley King of the first fleet ship, the Sirius. On January the 20th, 1788, only two days after arrival, King described in his private journal how he gave alcohol to two Aboriginal men encountered while the English explored some branches of the bay. I gave two of them a glass of wine, which they had no sooner tasted than they spit it out, and we asked them the name of a number of articles. The second account of this first taste is extraordinarily an Aboriginal one that survives after having passed through several intermediaries. It was remembered and reported by a Catholic priest, Father John McEnroe, to whom a Botany Bay man had told his own father's story. What with the passage of time and several iterations, it's not much to rely on, but the core of the narrative contains a rare glimpse of a real or imagined reaction to alcohol, to English alcohol, that is. And the story goes like this. From a Botany Bay beach, a group of Aborigines sees a ship which they think of as being a large bird and the people on it to be possums. A boat from the ship rows ashore and it is agreed among the Aborigines that two men should go down to the shore to investigate the strangers who are stepping unannounced onto their country. And on the beach, according to McEnroe, the following incident ensued. The two men were directed by the women particularly when going down to the water not to eat or drink anything that the strangers might give them for fear of being poisoned. One of the sailors then put something into a vessel and drank it off and wanted the natives to take some of the drink, but they refused for fear of being poisoned. He then offered them a tomahawk if they would drink. The men decided that if he drank some more without it killing him, then they would drink too and it would be safe. So the sailor did as they directed. He took some of the drink, was quite merry, and gave them the tomahawk, upon which one of them took some of the drink out of the vessel, but he had hardly done so when he thought he was burning alive, and he cried out to his companions in his own language, fire in eyes, fire in nose, and fire all over, and he ran off to throw himself in the water to quench the fire. There are many unknowns about this story, not the least of which is that McEnroe was told it as a Captain Cook story about his visit to Botany Bay in 1770. We know now that it could not have been the case as Cook didn't have any friendly interactions during his week there. It's probably a condensed version of memories and reflections of early contact, possibly embellished by McEnroe himself. But it's a moral tale, and it reveals alcohol was unknown, alien, and indeed unpleasant to those people in the South. It emphasizes the persuasion, the bribery, in fact, that took place in order to entice the Aboriginal men to drink. Maria Nugent, who's written about Botany Bay, described it as a Faustian bargain. <clears throat> the perception that alcohol was unknown and was foisted on indigenous Australians more or less against their will has persisted ever since. But perhaps what is most striking about the story, irrespective of either historical truth or the later reconstruction of it, is its emphasis on the fear of being poisoned by the white man's drink. So it could be thought that we know all that there is to know about the history of alcohol and its effects on Indigenous people. By now, the narrative is well established, and it goes like this. In 1788, with the First Fleet, came rum, grog and wine, exposing Aboriginal Australia to intoxicating drinks for the first time. The people were naturally, biologically vulnerable to the effects of alcohol, 
as they had no traditional knowledge of fermentation. And they were, as a prominent Australian historian has stated, instantly addicted to it. Indeed, addiction to alcohol came to be viewed as a special feature of the Aboriginal personality. The stories tell of Benelong, captured and constrained by Governor Philip and how he became a drinker. More than this, he became the first Aboriginal alcoholic. And alcohol was invariably introduced as a means of exploitation and subjugation. It turns out, however, that most of these ideas, so well embedded in our national consciousness, and some of them little removed from traditional colonial explanations, are either frankly incorrect or are open to serious challenge. They've obscured a richer, more complex and more paradoxical story of relating to Grog, and this is the subject of the books. The persistence of these particular narratives in the history of Australia has done great damage to the way in which Indigenous people feel about themselves, and stereotypes about the origins of Indigenous drinking problems contribute to what can only be called a resigned fatalism surrounding these issues today. Rather than Indigenous people being somehow doomed by their genes, as is commonly believed, the evidence points to the profound influence of socially and culturally learned behaviours. As the authors of the seminal study Drunken Comportment famously wrote, people learn about drunkenness what their society knows about it. And this is a rule that applies to all of us. One of the several paradoxes that I uncovered is that although Indigenous people were indeed very vulnerable to the volume and the strength of colonial drinks imported to Australia, some Aboriginal groups had made their own drinks prior to the British occupation, a fact that is not widely known. The idea that they had not in invented or discovered fermentation nor consumed intoxicating drinks prehistorically has had a covert and unhelpful impact. Somehow, this, the idea that Australia was the world's only dry continent has reinforced this view that people must have some biological feature that makes them more vulnerable to addiction. But the facts are a little different. There are at least three known, named and remembered drinks containing alcohol that were made traditionally. Mangach in Western Australia, Wyalina in Tasmania and Kambuda in the Northern Territory. So Mangach was reportedly made in the Bunbury region of Western Australia from the fermented cones of bank flowering banksias. It was documented by Robert Austin, a surveyor who travelled widely in the region in the 1840s, who passed his findings on to Walter E. Roth. And Wyalina was made by tapping the trunks of eucalyptus gunnii trees known as the cider gum in the high country of northern Tasmania. Aboriginal people collected the sweet sap around a pint a day in season that exuded from the trees and they stored it, leaving it to ferment, covering the liquid with a flat stone to protect it from birds and animals. This drink was documented in the 1830s by George Augustus Robinson. And in 2005, a Tasmanian Aboriginal artist, Mick Quilliam, made a painting of the cider tree showing the grooves around its base that he said were made by the footprints of the Palawa people who collected the sap. Mick told me that he and others have actually made the drink and tasted it. He compared it with light beer. And Cambodia was discovered, was documented by um, Bezadao in 1918 and more recently by the anthropologist John Bradley. This drink was made by people in the Borolula region at least until the 1980s from the roasted, crushed and soaked nuts of a spiral pandanus. Bezidau said it caused merriment and that on ceremonial occasions people drank more of it than usual. So these three fermented drinks and maybe others we don't know about 
were undoubtedly mild, low alcohol drinks. They did little to prepare people for the huge impact of much stronger spirits and wine. But they were alcoholic beverages. People did know how to make them, and they did have mood-altering effects. What is not known is who consumed them and under what circumstances. <clears throat> Excuse me. Another anomaly is this. <clears throat> Although spirits, especially rum, were the most damaging of the imported alcohols, up in the far north, on several islands in the Torres Strait, islanders willingly made and consumed a form of spirits themselves. In the 19th century, Torres Strait islanders learned from outsiders how to ferment and distill strong liquor. They named it tuba, a word that travelled with the people who brought the knowledge of the drink to the islands. These people were Filipinos who came to live and work in the strait and brought with them their own indigenous knowledge of making toddies from palm trees. And unlike the damaging effects of British rum, and despite the fact that this was a strong drink, the islanders' use of tuba seems to have been relatively problem-free. <clears throat> Alcohol was in fact given to indigenous Australians... <clears throat> excuse me given to people in many different ways, and not all these ways were exploitative, a finding that again contradicts some of the commonly held beliefs. It's not hard to find examples of exploitation, though. In early Sydney, respectable colonial families amused themselves by providing grog to Aboriginal men engaged in ritual combats. The fighters were egged on by Europeans who offered them bread and a glass of wine or brandy. The intoxication made these warriors forget the accepted protocols of the disputes and they fought brutally and indiscriminately. Other employers ruthlessly paid people in alcohol or gave them the rum casks to wash out, allowing people to drink the, the contents, this drink of the washings of rum casts was called bull. And it was common enough for early colonial artists to depict it. The people of the north were also given strong drinks and these drinks, the gifts of these drinks were made in a very different way to those of the Aboriginal people in the colonial south. So in the north, the alcohol was not even of European origin and neither was it part of a colonising project. It was offered with other goods in a respectful way by transient, though regular, visitors, the Macassan Trepang fishermen from Sulawesi. Alcohol was given to the Aboriginal peoples of the northern coastlines as payment and recognition for the Macassans' use of their land and sea. So this first taste in the north occurred more than a hundred years before the Yolngu and others had met Europeans, and 80 years before the first fleet had arrived at Botany Bay. Another surprise is that the drink itself, Arak, has a Middle Eastern origin. Its name derives from the Arabic, which is meaning to sweat. It was a distilled drink, and so the sweat name is probably a reference to the droplets produced in the distillation process. And while he was living in Macassar, Alfred Russell Wallace, the naturalist, observed large plantations of the trees that produced the juices from which this arak was made. And despite the limited availability of this drink and the fact that it was only there once a year, Aboriginal people in the northern areas who encountered Arak incorporated the drink into their linguistic and cultural lives. The Yungu and others adopted the term used by the Macassans for the drink, Nganiji, which itself derives from the Dutch, a reference to the aniseed that sometimes used to flavour Arak. And today, you have Aboriginal people in different language groups in that region who still deploy an 18th century Dutch word, which they now use to refer to all alcoholic beverages. The Macassan song cycle 
still performed today by the Yolngu and other groups includes a nanaji sequence, which is followed significantly, perhaps, by the fist fight dance and the tobacco dance. In the nanaji dance, the performers mime drinking and drunkenness using plastic cool drink bottles. And according to eyewitnesses, though, the drinking behaviour observed by the Aboriginal people also included amiable drinking. So there was no single type of drunken comportment that was witnessed by Aboriginal people there. Captured by Governor Philip, who needed brokers and conciliators with the Aboriginal people. The inevitable linking of Benelong with alcohol is even immortalised in the naming of an Aboriginal treatment program after him, Benelong's Haven. The founders of the program chose the name because they knew the story of this Wangal man from the south of the Parramatta River. He was described as the first Aboriginal alcoholic, the original hard-drinking Australian. But the historical record, read a little carefully, is a little more nuanced. Ben Long is interesting not just because of his liking for wine, but he also does not deserve his reputation. But he's also interesting because he was the first Aboriginal individual who was consciously taught an English drinking ritual. He learned to drink the toast. Ben Long ate dinner every day at the governor's house where he learned to drink to the health of the king the most common toast of the day. People raised their glasses, announced the toast, the king, and drank. He thought at first that this was naming the drink, believing that da king referred to the wine itself. Jacqueline Troy, in her Sydney language collection, has documented that Aboriginal people over a wide area of New South Wales referred to alcohol by this name after this. Like others of his day, Benelong discovered that the toast was a way of getting in a few extra drinks. But until his death in 1813, no contemporary writer actually mentions seeing him drunk. There is no evidence that he became a dependent drinker at all. It was only his obituary in the Sydney newspaper that spoke harshly of his propensity to drunkenness when he became insolent and menacing and it seems that this media item alone did the damage. Benelong's obituary gave birth to the Australian version of a colonial stereotype that has persisted ever since. The story of that first drink at Botany Bay contained all the key elements that go to make up the commonly accepted larger narratives of Indigenous Australians and alcohol, white people, alien substance unprepared consumers, poison, coercion, blame. Alcohol's socially poisonous effects have since been the subject of years of anxious debate, legislative intervention, restriction and resistance. But there is more to the story than is commonly known, as I hope to have shown. What is known sometimes has little to support it. The Botany Bay people were not the first Aborigines in Australia to drink imported alcohol. Such drinks were not even first brought to Australia by Europeans, but by Southeast Asian peoples. Some Aboriginal people made their own mild drinks before the incursions from overseas. Benelong, supposedly the first Aboriginal alcoholic, was most probably not an alcoholic after all. There was no unitary response to alcohol, Aboriginal people and Torres Strait Islanders responded in a variety of ways to it initially and in the years that followed. And alcohol exerted its most damaging force, not in colonial times, but more recently, when the repeal of Indigenous prohibition collided with the onset of late 20th century growth in the liquor industry and with the subsequent liberalisation of alcohol availability. Thank you.